<laughs> just like we did it the first time. Okay, so on Monday we talked about buffer overflow vulnerabilities, and specifically we saw how we can use buffer overflow vulnerabilities to first uh, control the saved instruction pointer, which then allows us to start executing any code we want, right? And then we saw how shell code is code that can be used to basically do whatever we want, right? And so we saw that we can use a not sled to be able to uh, allow us a little more leeway in where we jump in that address that we overwrite in the saved instruction pointer. And so very broadly, right, so why? Why does a buffer overflow work? What's, what's kind of one of the key problems? The size of the buffer is always fixed, yeah. But if the size of the buffers were fixed, would that necessarily mean that buffer overflows were a problem? Like in Java, you can create arrays that aren't, that are fixed size, right? Yeah. It's the importance of the memory in close proximity to the end of the buffer. So the fact that it's in close proximity of the buffer? Well, then that you can write it, write to it. Right. That's the key thing, right? So should your program ever write to the saved base pointer and the saved instruction pointer on the stack? No, right? That is not, there's not, those, those variables aren't in your C program, right? They're not variables that you, the programmer, declared, hey, I want to write to and change this value, right? These are just implicitly there based on the side effects of how x86 and how C does function calls, right, and the calling convention. So more generally, right, so it's very tempting to think of buffer overflows as this very specific, you have a buffer and it's on the stack and you overwrite the return address on the stack and that's a security vulnerability and that's a buffer overflow. And that is a buffer overflow, you know, at the core nuts and bolts. But really, if we want to think about it a little bit more abstractly, really the problem is that the adversary can write to memory in our process space that they weren't supposed to. And so if I gave you the ability to just write to any memory location in my program, you could effectively carry out a buffer overflow attack without necessarily overflowing any buffers, right? And you use the same techniques. You use the shellcode techniques, and you would use uh, you would overwrite the save instruction pointer in order to do whatever you want. Question? No, I thought I saw one in the corner. So. There's an entire class of vulnerabilities that are more broad than just buffer overflows that kind of generalize this concept of essentially memory corruption, right? Because the problem is an adversary can alter memory content in our program, right? And so we think about this in a few ways. So one is, so what is being overwritten, right? Is it the return address or even the frame pointer, right? So in this case, we'll see a little bit later, uh, if we can overwrite the, the save base pointer and the save return address, we can control the execution of the program, right? But that's not our only target, and that's not, this isn't 100% required for taking control of the program, right? We actually saw in testing the shellcode that you can declare variables and you can have function pointers in C, right? And so if one of those are, we can overwrite and control a pointer to a function. Well, when that function gets called, it basically jumps to whatever is inside that variable. So by controlling this, we can control where the program goes. We can even change pointers to data, right? If we have a pointer to some uh, character string, right, and that character string is the program to be executed, then we can overwrite this pointer to point to our data and make it execute our program. Right? So it's not just the control flow or the control of the program, like these two that can be corrupted, right? but changing the pointer to data can alter the execution flow of the program to get it to do whatever we want. And even as simple as a variable's value, right? there may be one variable that says if the user is an administrator or not. Right? And if we can change that one value to be one instead of zero, just that one bit, that's the only bit we need to write to the program, and now we've taken full control over it. 
Uh, the other way to think about it is, okay, so this is what are we overriding, or what are we writing, what are we corrupting in memory? Then the question is, so what causes the overwrite, right? As we saw, unchecked copying can overflow, right, and allow us to overwrite and write into memory that we're not supposed to. Also, array indexes, right? So what's an array index in C? How is that actually done? Isn't it just taking the, the given integer and uh, multiplying by the size of each element or something like that? Yeah, so it doesn't have to be exactly an integer, but yeah, the basic idea is, right, so you have A bracket B. So it, it actually, under the hood, does pointer arithmetic, so it will move it, increment that address that's inside there by the size of whatever it is. But effectively, all that it translates to is the A plus B dereference. Right, so you can actually write your, um, it's completely valid C to do, oh, I don't know if I want to get risk of a crash again. <laughs> right, so it's completely valid C code to write, so if I have a character pointer B, I can write uh, B10 equals A, right, B like this, right? What this is doing under the hood Right? That's all this, this array index operator is syntactic sugar for this, which actually means you can write your array accesses like this. This is completely valid C code. This will compile 100%. And under the hood, essentially what's happening is it's taking the address of B, uh, adding 10 times the size of whatever B points to, in this case a character, right? and then it's dereferencing that that memory address, right? So is this array access here, let's say uh, with 10, is that in the bounds of B? And just by looking at this, we actually have no way of knowing, right? What if, uh, you know, B could have been the string hello, in which case it has three, four, six bytes with the null byte, right? Um, and array access, because it's just a simple arithmetic operator, right, there's absolutely no checkings to see if we're inside the bounds or where this result currently is. So that's another way that we can access and overwrite memory. Ta da! Looks like we're lucky. Uh, also, so sometimes, so what's an integer overflow? What range of integers can a 32-bit unsigned uh, integer contain in C? X86. Two thirty-two minus one. Uh, signed. Yeah, Right. So that'd be two to the thirty-one, I think, right? Oh yeah. Negative two to thirty-one to two to the thirty-one. There's minus one somewhere in there, right? So what happens if you're at two to the thirty-one minus five, let's say? You're almost at the border, and you add 20 to that number. Yeah, it'll actually go around and go negative. I don't know if it's exactly, I have to look at how exactly that number is going to turn out, but it's going to turn into a negative number, right? So in this way, we've overflowed the integer. The same thing even with unsigned integers, right? So 2 to the 32, if we add you know, 2 to the 32 minus 5, if we add 10 to that, we're going to roll around and get number 5 again. Uh, and the same thing with subtraction, right? So if we take 5, an unsigned 5, and we subtract 10 from it, that number is now going to be a huge number, not a negative number, because this is an unsigned number. Uh, so these can lead to problems, especially if you're using integers for array indexing, right? If we can cause an integer to overflow and either become negative, well, now you're going to go in a different direction from the array. You're definitely going to be out of bounds from an array access. Um, we can also make it more lar larger than it thinks it should be. All kinds of fun stuff. Uh, we can also, so loop overflows, this is one where if we can control the number of iterations a loop happens as, we can maybe make it write more than it should. Right? Like if we can control that index or that size or however many it's doing, right? So this is kind of a, a think about a custom copy overflow, right? 
where we can try to influence how it's going to copy. So the other question is, where is this data that we're overriding? Right? Is it on the stack, as we saw? Or is it on the heap? Or in the VSS segment, or in the data segment? Right? And each of these can have different security implications depending on the information. Uh, the other thing that's very fun to play with, so the global offset table. Uh, remember we talked about dynamic loading in x86 and on Linux and C. So what does dynamic loading mean? What was that? That should have written the PID. Yeah, so the basic idea, right, is uh, we want to call a libc function or some other function, right? But we don't want to compile libc into our program. So we say, our program says, hey, I'm using libc functions printf. And so at runtime, when we call the printf function, what first happens is we go out and the system will go look for printf, load it into our process space, or libc library, and then link up our program and say, hey, uh, printf is at this offset. So as we'll see later, the global offset table actually is a table that contains for every uh, dynamically loaded function that you call, it has a memory address that your code always jumps to to try to call that. Uh, so it's a little bit of indirection to do this, um, this setup. Uh, but as we'll see, if we're able to overwrite that, we can get our program to jump to wherever we want. And the beautiful thing about the global offset table is it never changes. It's always constant because uh, your program needs to know where to call, right? But printf could be loaded at any place in memory. So that's why it uses this global offset table to know first where to go, and then something else happens to then do this dynamic linking. Okay. So looking a little bit more about what we can overwrite, um, in general, right? Any if we're over, if we're able to change any value in a program that could represent a security vulnerability, right? And this is kind of the critical thing we've been talking about. Security vulnerabilities are application dependent, right? So if we can overwrite that, it may be a security vulnerability or it may just be a bug. Right? It may not actually allow us to do anything. Uh, so we could change the value of a variable. So if it's printing out some, some uh, file, oh, I can't remember I forgot the name, file. Uh, it's printing out some file based on a string, and we're able to change that string to point to the string etc shadow, then we'll output etc shadow for us. Um, if we can change integer values, then that integer value is passed to set UID to change its to change its ID to the user ID that's given. Usually if root wants to then execute as a root program for a little bit and then change its, its, um, its privileges, drop its privileges to a lower one, if we can change that, we can force it to stay as root. Um, we can change the value of the save base pointer. So what's the save base pointer used as? Yes, every function has its own base pointer, right? So when our function gets called, we save our caller's base pointer, right? So that, that way when we return, we put that base pointer back into EBP. But what is the base pointer used inside of a function? Yeah, all the local variables, right? So if we can, let's say we can't change the instruction pointer, but if we can change the saved base pointer, now when this function returns, all local variables and everything will be offsets from this base pointer that we control. Right? So we can actually make this program think that we can completely change the local variables in that function. And as we'll see later, we can actually completely control then, uh, once we control that, we can make it do whatever we want and control the, just like as if we're controlling the saved instruction pointer. Um, and the idea is, Right, every function before it uh, before it returns in the epilogue sets the stack pointer to the current base pointer, right, and then calls return, which jumps to whatever is on there. So if we're able to control the base pointer, point it let's say somewhere else where we control, 
it's going to move the stack pointer to the base pointer, right? And then it's going to jump, so it's going to return to whatever address we put in there. So that's uh, how we're able to control the instruction pointer through the base pointer. And so by changing function pointers, right? So we can change in the so in the global offset table is a list of function pointers. So we can change a global offset table entry and we write to it to point to our code. Then whenever it calls printf, it's actually going to call our code. This is actually kind of a fun game you can play. You can change the functions that are going to get invoked at certain times. So maybe you can call have them call system instead of printf. Um, it's a very cool technique. Other thing we can overwrite that's really cool is long jumps. So what are long jumps? Really long jump. Yeah. Uh, the memory address which are not in the memory box. Uh, Say that again. Uh, the memory addresses which are not currently in the memory and we have to uh, re refresh them to our different <laughs> What do we use long jumps for? Uh, calls calling some address. Ah, very close. So, yeah, so the, the idea is so how far can you jump in, in x86? Actually, that's, maybe that's the wrong way to phrase it. Actually, I don't know the answer to that, so let's ignore that for now. Uh, how do you do, so what happens in Java when you have some error, right? Let's say you tried to open a file that file didn't exist. What happens? An exception gets thrown, right? So then who handles that exception? Any function on the call stack, right? That, has a handler for that. So you can think about the control flow is jumping from one uh, invocation of a function all the way to a completely other function higher on the stack, right? And you can't really, you don't really just want to do a regular jump, right? If you think about x86 and C, because you have, you know, you're not, uh, that function is not currently on the stack, so you need to change the stack, you need to do a whole bunch of other things, right? So long jumps are a way to do essentially um, exception handling in C. So you can jump all the way from however many functions down you are back to your original function. And the environment's going to be the same as if you never left. So it's similar in some sense to a go to or a jump but it restores the program state at that point. So you can normally only go to in a one function, right? Because otherwise, if you try to go to another function, what does that even mean, right? What's the state of the function at that point? What are the values in the local variable? Um, so you use this set jump call, as we'll see. It's going to save the context of that function at that uh, into a data structure, and then so as we'll see, it's kind of like fork in a sense. So it's going to save the context at this point, and then when you call a long jump, when you call a jump to jump back to it, it's going to be as if this set jump returned a different value. Um, so yeah, you can see here that, so when we save it, when we initially call set jump, it's going to return a zero. So we can branch on the return value of set jump. If it's a zero, we know, okay, this is our first invocation of this function. But if somebody else calls a long jump with this environment, then our program is going to be essentially rolled back and reset to as if set jump returned something that's not zero, something that was ever passed here. So we can actually use this as an exception handling mechanism. Yeah? yeah sorry, I didn't get long jump exactly. What the, what is, how is it different from jump? Can you uh, long jump you could do from different function invocations. So, no matter what the state of the stack is at that point, you can call a long jump to go back to essentially unwind everything to where what the stack was before you went right when you called the set jump. So it's used as exception handling, right? So usually in C, you do exceptions by uh, checking return values, right? Uh, but this is a way that you can do exception handling by literally jumping back into the code that called you. So before the long Long jump, I have to set jump. Yes. Yeah, you have to set it up, right? And you think about that saves the state of your program at that point. And then later on when you call long jump, it reverts your program back to that point. But with the change of the return value of set jump such that you can tell which thing happened. 
right? Am I calling am I calling set jump to set it up, or did I actually come back here? And then you can use that x, that value that got passed in here, to pass some information back. So you can tell them what exception occurred and uh, what problems happened. So we'll look at some code that uses this. So we have our main function. So we have to declare a jump buffer, right? And so set jump is going to save our current environment right at this point. And if it returns zero, then we know we didn't have any, have any errors, right? Uh, or not, sorry, not that we didn't have any errors. It returns zero the first time we call set jump. So we call set jump, it's going to return zero. So this branch isn't going to happen. We're going to print out the value of i, which is going to be garbage. We should have set i. We're very bad people. Then we're going to call some other function f1 and pass in this jump buffer, this environment. So then f1 is going to take in a jump buffer and do some calculations. So this is like pseudocode, right? So it's going to do some calculations. It's going to check if there was some error condition. Then it's going to long jump using E with error code 1. Then when it does this long jump, it actually jumps, the program jumps back to here with set jump as if I was never set and this return value returns error 1. And then it will exit. Uh, if the check went fine, let's say there was no error here, it's going to call F2. Right, so now our call stack is main f1, f2. And now f2 is going to do some computations. And if there's an error, it's then going to long jump back all the way to set jump, right, above the two functions. And it's going to be as if set jump returned error 2. It's actually a pretty powerful technique, right, that we can do this in C, which is a language you wouldn't think has sophisticated, like, you know, exception handling. Uh, how far can you jump up? Is there a limit for that? I don't think so, because of the way it's implemented, as we'll see. Um, I think this is per th process only. You, you can't jump to another process, right? That yeah. really makes sense. Um, yeah, you're trying to test the limits. So then the question is, how does this work, right, under the hood? It seems kind of like magic. Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. So a jump buffer is just an array. And basically what happens is we're going to save inside this jump buffer, we're going to save the base pointer and the stack pointer and register values. We're going to save all the values of the registers. And so when we call long jump, we're going to just change everything back to where we were. So that's how we can get back to where we were. But if you notice something very interesting here, PC, right? So that'd be program counter or instruction pointer, right? So we're actually saving on the stack the instruction pointer at that point. And so if we look at how the long jump is kind of done, we move uh, I put these backwards. Yeah, no, it's fine. We're moving i, whatever, whatever the value is passed in the long jump, we move that into EAX because that's going to be the return value of the long jump call. Then we're using this jump buffer and getting the base pointer offset to set the base pointer. And this is kind of pseudocode too, right? You can't really do end dot underscore underscore jump buff, right? But uh, to, to show you the thing, right? So here, now we've changed the base pointer back to our original calling function. Now we change the stack pointer back to our, the original function, not the calling function, sorry, but the function that called set jump, right? We're setting the base pointer and stack pointer there. And then we jump to whatever's inside the jump pointer PC. And that's going to be the instruction that's directly after set jump. So it's going to be just as if we called set jump here. And all of our local variables are actually still on the stack because they're offset from the base pointer on the stack. Yeah? Why is it back to exactly where set jump is? Because it still has to do the. It's the return. So it's if, as if set jump returned, 
which would be set jump returns when the next instruction after it is executed. But we're setting the EAX, we're setting the return value to be whatever I was passed in here. So this means, as we saw, jump buffer is storing this program counter on the stack, which is where our code's gonna jump to, right? So that by overriding this jump buffer, we can control where the code jumps to. Because on jump buffer is gonna store this program counter, which should be the next instruction after the set jump call. And so using this, we can modify the control flow of an application. Uh, so we need something that where they call set jump on an environment. Uh, we have some overflow attack that changes the, that we can overflow environment, right? So either directly access or change. And then exactly what we want to do, right? So just like any other buffer overflow or any kind of overflow, we want to change that PC in that environment structure to have the address of our shell code uh, so that that way, oh, and you, yeah, you want to make sure that the base pointer and the stack pointer are pointing to valid memory, right? Because we may, uh, I think we're going to, we may dereference those, right? So we want to make sure that the stack and the base pointer are valid. But they don't have to be exactly where they need to be. And then we need to cause the program to invoke this long jump, right? Just doing the overwrite isn't anything if they don't use it to jump. So this is just trying to show that, um, I really like this because it shows, so it's a cool feature and a cool library that you know, you'd think of using, right? But you wouldn't necessarily think of the security implications of, well, what if they, if I overwrite my buffer, well that's fine uh, because I'm using stack protection and my saved instruction pointer is protected, but here your code is essentially jumping to something that's on the stack that an attacker can write to. So what do we learn from this? Yeah? yeah so uh, this is overload, but what is the X used X is the return value of, you think of it as the return value of long jump, it's going to be the return value of set jump. Yeah, so, so ideally we are changing that value, right? No, we need to change E and V. That E and V is a structure that's on the stack. So we need to change E and V to point to, uh, we need to change the value that's inside E and V, which is a program counter value in there. We need to change that so that that way when it's restored and it tries to jump there, it'll jump into our shell code. Does that make sense? So right here on this fourth line, it is jumping to whatever's in environment at offset JB underscore PC. So that's what we want to control because it's essentially doing an indirect jump, right? It's taking a value from memory and jumping to it. So if we can overwrite and control this env dot underscore underscore jump buff, then we can get the program to jump wherever we want. So essentially, I does not play a role in the attack. Who does? I. No, I. We don't care about. It. We just need to be able to invoke it. Yeah. So what do we learn from this, and in general from this example? Actually, there's a few ways to think about the lessons learned, right? So you can think about it from the attacker's perspective, right? Any place in the program that control flow mysteriously changes, we should probably try to investigate how we could overflow that. Yeah, because without knowing exactly how set jump and get jump, you know, set jump and long jump work, you know, you have to dig into this, the code to see exactly how this is done to see how you can control this. Yeah, so from the attacker's perspective, anytime the control flow can change funny like that, is a place that we can attack. So is it enough to, to say, let's protect EI, the saved EIP on the stack? Let's protect that. Then are we done? We'll never have any buffer overflow vulnerabilities. 
Why? changing the EIP, you just change where it's pointing to and change. Yeah, so um, if you think about it, so in general, like with this, uh, we're talking about what to overflow, right? So here it's a jump buffer. It could be, like we said, just a Boolean value. It could be a string, right? So there's all kinds of sensitive data structures, right, that are security sensitive to our program. And so you need to be extra careful to make sure that those can't be overwritten. Right? It's not enough to just say, okay, they're going to come in through, it's like, um, uh, I don't think I've told it here. So one of my favorite stories, a uh, professor at UCSD, Dick Kemmerer, told me that uh, they got hired to do red teaming on e-voting machines. So the Secretary of State came to them and was like, you know, we want you to test these voting machines to see, uh, you know, to see what you can do to break in. And so they go to Sacramento. And they're inside this basement because this is the only room where they can have unlimited access to this voting machine. And so Dick gets in there, and the guy's talking with him, and he's like, look at this lock like on the front of the machine. You know, it's just a PC, but there's a lock on the machine. He's like, look at this lock. It's, I'm going to make up words, but it's diamond-coated, double-encrusted. It's like only this. It's a special key that has like special bits. And, Nobody could, you can't even make a key like this. Nobody makes keys like this. Like, there's absolutely no way you're ever going to break this lock. This is the best lock that has ever existed in the history of the world. And Dick's just like, okay, cool. You know, this is, you're trying to learn all you can, so he's learning. And then he says, the guy leaves, right? And he looks at it and he goes, yeah, that looks like a very fancy lock, right? I'm, I will probably not try to break that lock. But then he looks at it some more. And he sees that there's some screws that are keeping the hinges on the machine on the other side. So he takes a screwdriver, and then the door comes off. <laughs> so this is about, the point is thinking about, ah, they're coming after the instruction pointer. We have to save the instruction pointer, right? We've got to make sure they can't do anything to the instruction pointer. We're focusing so much on the front door that maybe you don't think about the hinges. Right? Or even the back side of the door. What about the back side? Is there a fancy lock on the back side? Probably not, right? So, um, so yeah, so this I want you to think about, right? Because attackers are very lazy, right? They're going to try to find the easiest way into your program possible. So if you make it very difficult for them to go this way, they say, well, let's try a different route, right? Let's try the back door, let's try a window. Okay. So let's look at more about what is over, so looking at what can be overwritten. So let's look at this super secure program. So we have a character array of usernames, character array of passwords, and we're doing string and copy. So how many bytes are going to be copied? And from where to where? Where's the source and the destination? From argv1 into password. From argv1 into password, yeah. Uh, then we're doing copy 512 bytes from argv2 into username. Then we're printing out, hey, that we're checking this password for some user. And then we're going to call the check password function passing in password. So inside check password, we're going to copy, do string copy from p to my pwd. To create a copy of that, we're going to check it and say, hey, we're checking this, and then we're going to return. Is there any, can we do any overflows here? Should we remove that question mark? So let's think about it like this. Can this overflow the saved instruction pointer or the saved base pointer? This line right here. No. Right? Only 512 bytes. That's the only thing it's going to output right, in the password. <coughs> what about this line? Same thing, right? Only 512 bytes. So when we look at here, we think string copy. Well, A, 
So we should be thinking, hmm, they really should have used string and copy here. Yeah. Yes, right? But they did not. But why not? Argue for the developer. Why did the developer not do a string end copy here? Yeah, it's 512 bytes, and he already did a string end copy in the password of 512 bytes, right? So in the developer's mind, he or she is thinking that, okay, P is only ever going to be 512 bytes, right? I just did this copy. So what are the exact semantics of string end copy? This is one of the things you should do whenever you have an unknown program, right? And it's using library functions. If you don't know exactly the semantics of how it's doing and operating, you should look at it again because it can give you ideas. Right? This is something I do all the time when I'm looking at unknown binaries. So we have string n copy. So we first need to verify that our understanding of string n copy was right about who's the destination and who's the source, right? That's that's step number one. Uh, so we see, yes, source, destination, length. So we see that, okay, the string pn copy and the string n copy functions copy at most length characters from source to destination, right? So we know it's only going to copy 512 characters from the source to the destination. So if source is less than length characters long, then the remainder of destination is filled with zero characters. What does this last thing mean? Otherwise it continues copying. Yeah, otherwise it stops copying, right? It only copies 512 bytes. But it does not guarantee that it puts a terminating zero byte at the end of the buffer. So, let's go back to our example. Getting better. I mean, I think we're getting better at recovering. Okay. So let's look. This string end copy, right? So let's say we copy, let's say the attacker passes in 500 bytes for the password, right? A string of 500 bytes. Then what is the password buffer on the stack going to look like after that happens, based on what we just read from string end copy? The 500 bytes of the password plus 12. Yeah, 500 bytes of the password plus 12 zeros. So what's the string length of that buffer then? 500. What happens if we pass in 511 bytes for argv1? Then what does the password look like? Password buffer. Yeah, it'll be 511 bytes followed by one zero. What happens if we pass in 512 bytes? Yeah, it's going to be just 512 characters, no zeros, right? Because it said exactly what it's going to do. It's going to say only in the case that it's less will it put zeros in there. So let's say we do. So let's say we do that, right? And then we put I don't know, 200 bytes into username. So then, what's the string length of password? Uh, okay, so let's say that the stack layout is exactly like it is in this example. So that you first have password, and then above that you have username. So the stack is exactly like this. Username plus uh, password plus username. Yes, right? So if we pass 512 bytes for password, and then we pass another 200 bytes for username, now when we calculate the string length of password, it's going to go, okay, keep going until I hit a zero byte. And it will go past those 512 bytes all the way up those extra 200 bytes for username until it gets the zero in username. So now, if we think about this string copy, now what could the size of P be? Yeah, in that case, 700. We could make it all the way up to, yeah, what is it? 1024 is about as far as you want to go. 
because if you did username 512 bytes too, then who knows when your string's gonna end, right? It's until it hits the next null byte on the stack. Right, so we can overflow the my password buffer by passing in a password that has the exact length that has 512 bytes so that, that way the resulting password string is actually bigger because of how these are laid out on the stack. Yeah. So if you go bigger, it's also not going to be null terminated, right? It just won't copy that the last. If you do two, if you do 512 and 512. No, if I said like password is 513, it just will cut off that last. Yes, byte. it will cut off that last byte. So you don't have to do 512 exactly, but. So yeah. So you can think of this kind of as like a null terminated string overflow, right? The problem is that string did not have a null terminating character in it. So that way when we use it as a string, it can actually overflow onto the stack and be more than the programmer expected it to do. Um, this also drives me crazy that here we have this quote, quote, safe function, right? Which actually can, so this is especially tricky because you're looking at this code and you think, okay, you, you s store in your mind the you know string and copy safe, string copy unsafe, right? But really, if you use this incorrectly, string and copy can be just as unsafe, right? And also notice how this was kind of a cascading problem, right? If that my password buffer was 1024 bytes, or maybe even larger, then we may not be able to overflow it and control everything, depending on what's on the stack above username. That would be a little bit weird. I wonder how that would work. That'd be interesting. Hmm. No, because the next thing is going to be the save base pointer. So, oh, that won't have zeros. And then the save instruction pointer. And then above that's going to be argc. And then argv1, argv2. Yeah, actually, it would probably be pretty big. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, so as an attacker, I wouldn't have access to this code, right? So, but just by looking at the object, then how can I determine, like, 512 is the number I want to know? Ah. If I pass something more than 512, right? So, Yes, so I would, so you can, well, you can still use object dump to look, right? Because you'll know that at some point in the program, it'll be call string and copy, right? So you know that at that program point, the stack must be from the bottom up, password argv1512, or pass, sorry, you don't know this yet. So you'll know that the first thing on the stack is going to be the destination. The next thing above that is going to be the source. And the thing above that is going to be n. And then you can trace through the code to see what gets put on the stack eight above. And that will give you the end. The other thing you can do is you can run ltrace, because ltrace will trace all the library functions. And it will output exact, it does that conversion. So it will show you, hey, the program called string end copy with some buffer, with some other buffer with the value 512. So then that is when you should start thinking about trying to do some 512 stuff. Yeah. And that it's calling string copy after. Yes, that's the other thing, that's right? It never here. called the other string copy. So this kind of, that would probably focus your attention first, right? So you see this string copy, and then you start salivating and go, okay, how can I make this <laughs> P, how can I make P more than 512 bytes, right? If I do that, then I know I've got the program. And then you look at all the calls to check password in the program to see what's being passed in and if you can influence the size of that buffer. And then that's when you look here and see its password, and you start maybe trying to understand this program.
so yeah, so that's one reason, and we'll see another reason with return-oriented programming. Uh, it completely bypasses ASLR with no, um, well, whatever word I just used. No not, no not, okay. Yes? So could you create, have another program running in a separate thread even, or a separate process that has a huge not sled that does what you want and then reference send the EIP to Someone. No, because each process is in its own address space. So you can't jump to somebody else's address space. What you can do and what happens with your browsers, um, so remember browsers, the attack model is really crazy, right? Because you have JavaScript code that's running on the browser and the JavaScript code can do stuff, right? So what the way they get around ASLR with browser-based exploits is they create a bunch of NOP and shell code they allocate a bunch of those in basically the heap of your um, browser, and then they just try randomly jumping there. So I, it's called a heap spraying. So you basically like spray your knob and your shell code everywhere all over the heap, and then you try your exploit, and then hopefully sometimes you'll be right, right? Because you've put so many of those throughout the stack. So even ASL or whatever, you've done this so many times, you're very likely to jump to one of those locations. Kind of similar thing, but it's in the same process space is the big difference. Yeah, those kind of exploits are super crazy because hey, it's all kinds of reasons. Okay, so in general, right? So this is so this is kind of a different type of overflow. Here, we're not actually overflowing any of the buffers, really, right? We're staying within the bounds of the buffer, but we're not terminating our strings, and that allows us some kind of um, so yeah, some functions like string end copy, which you'd assume to be safe, are actually not because they don't include that terminating zero. And so this way, if you have some adjacent buffers or you can control that data that's after it, you can get it to copy more information. So what should we do here? What what should we learn from this? Give an answer one less than one. Yeah, so that's one way to do it, right, is pass into string end copy uh, the length minus one. Honestly, string end copy should do that by itself. Like, it's crazy that it doesn't do that. Um, the other way is to always make sure your string is null terminated, right? So make sure after you do a string end copy that you set the buffer bracket 512, no, 511 to zero, right? So yeah, you want to make sure that there's a null byte at the end of all of your character arrays. Okay. Yes, okay, so index overflow. So we're gonna go over this quickly, and then I think we'll be done uh, for today. So index overflow, so this is if you're able to control the index into an array, right? Because we saw using the bracket notation or any kind of array access in C does not check the boundaries of that array to see if this array access is inside the boundaries. Um, and this is actually, if you can, absolutely control the index of that array, it's kind of nice because you can, over, you're more of like, a, as buffer overflow, you're kind of like, um, you're, just, you're like the Hulk, you're just like smashing everything, right? You're like, ah, I'll just smash one of this stuff, right? With this, you get to precisely control one thing of memory, and you get to say exactly where you want it to be based on this offset of the buffer. Uh, so it's a little bit, it's much more precise. Uh, not quite as precise as, some other attacks, but you, it requires some precision. Um, and so depending on this type of the array can change what you can do or not do. So you have to be careful about what you're doing. So if we look at an example, here we have an array, we have an index, we have some value. We are taking in argv1, interpreting it as a, a base 10 number, and copying that to index, and then we're copying uh, as base 16, a value into argv2, into value, and then we're setting array index equals value. And then we're returning. All right, so what can we do? So what can we control here? So we can't overflow the array, right? This is part of the thing about this, is you see the buffer and you think, ah, I wanna overflow that buffer, right? But if we just control this index here, because we control the value, we can control index, which we obviously do in this simple example, then we're able to write wherever we want based on the offset of array. So we can write up, down, however we want, and 
Index can be a 32-bit number, so we can go as high or as low as we want to do. So we can really overwrite any memory in reference to array. Um, so if we overflow 11, so why 11 here? It is greater than 8. Yes. Uh, it'll do a core dump. But why specifically 11? So at array... So you have, a, so it's actually going to be, it should be, well, so you have to look at the, at the object dump to see exactly how the stack is laid out, right? But assuming it's value index array eight, right? So eight above array is gonna to point to the end of the array. Oh yeah, the nine will point to say BDP and 10, no, that's not right. Oh, Yeah, it should point to EIP, but why? No, but won't, they, won't the args be on the stack? Args are above the saved EIP. Are they above it? It's local variables, save base pointer, save EIP, arg C, arg B. Yeah. Exactly. If you do an object down to index and value are above it. Okay, so it will automatically sort it like that because GCC hates me. Um, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, so it should be like this. Okay, so we eight, nine will get you to value, let's say, 10 will get you to index, 11 will get you to base pointer, so that's why it's crashing, is because it's overflowing the base pointer. Right, so when it's returns, it's setting the base pointer, and then something else is doing something, so it's crashing there. It should be 10, 12, probably, if you want to do an overflow. We have to look at the example. So, uh, you need to check array indexes, right, to make sure they're within bounds. That's up to you, the programmer, to do, and it's something you should look for when you are exploiting these programs. 